Good evening, everybody. So we are going to continue. Um, we're going to continue with our church history class. So now we're actually starting on the ministry of Christ. So th that's what we're going to start with. So last time, um, last time what we did is we went over the intertestamental period where we covered everything that you needed to know between Malachi and Matthew. A lot of stuff happened, right? You close the book, of the, you close the pages of the Old Testament, and you open up the pages of the New Testament. There's a lot of things that are in the New that weren't in the Old, and so they required some explanation. So we covered that last time. So now there's one more thing to do before we actually get to the history of the church. We have to get to the the founder of the church, Jesus Christ. Okay. So the whole purpose of this lesson, this lecture, is to go over the ministry of Jesus, and there's a, a lot to cover here but I'm going to try to knock it out in one shot. And so just uh, jumping straight into it. So uh, we, well, actually, let me pray first. Um, Albert's not here to remind me of that, but for church history lessons, I normally don't pray, but let's go ahead and do that. Lord God, we just thank you that we're able to gather together tonight and uh, talk about you, Jesus, and really in a, in a single lecture, try to summarize um, your ministry, your identity, uh, and pretty much how this is going to be the basis of the, the founding of the church, Lord. And so uh, just help me remember everything I'm supposed to remember and that everybody would learn what they're supposed to learn. We pray this all in, in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, jumping right into it, in church history, the primary person to begin with is Jesus Christ for obvious reasons. Matthew 16, 18, he said he will build his church. Okay? So we do need to look at the details of his life, you know, who Jesus is, what he did, and so forth. And so there's different ways that people like to uh, divide up his life or his ministry. So some people will say, we'll uh, talk about it in terms of his active ministry and his passive ministry. And you find that from John's gospel. Others will uh, focus more on his, it'll be geographic. So they'll focus on his ministry in Galilee and then how it moves to Jerusalem, you know, before his passion. Um, and, then, uh, and then some focus specifically on um, on just his power and then his passion, right? And so I'll give you some of those as we go on a little further, as we get uh, deeper into the lesson. Um, so in addition to covering how the Gospels present Jesus, we also need to talk about the, hist the, the quest for the historical Jesus, um, which is popular in scholarship. And uh, you might not know a lot about it, but I'm telling you, every like Christmas and Easter season on History Channel, you see annoying documentaries that uh, try to downplay what the Bible says, that's all part of the historical quest. And so um, I'll break that down for you. That way you kind of understand uh, what you're seeing and hearing when those documentaries come on. And then, of course, we need to understand the identity of Jesus theologically. And so we'll be doing that. We'll be hitting that as well. So the first thing we need to do is just state very simply that Jesus' existence did not begin in that manger. Okay? It didn't begin in the womb of Mary. Jesus is God in the flesh. So if we're going to talk about Jesus, let's just real quickly talk about the fact that there is a Jesus pre-incarnate, that Jesus is as old as the Father, which is an absurd statement because the Father's not old. He's ageless, right? He's, he's eternal. And what I'm saying is Jesus is just as eternal, okay? For the Father to be a Father, He always had to have the Son. And for the Son to be a Son, He always had to have the Father, right? And so you have one God, that one God's three persons, and what we are talking about is we're talking about the second person of the Trinity before he took on flesh. So, of course, there's biblical passages that speak to that. Uh, most famously, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Uh, he made everything. And so when you take the in the beginning from John 1, don't confuse it with the in the beginning in Genesis 1. The in the beginning in Genesis 1 is talking about the beginning of everything that was made. Okay, in John... One is just talking about the beginning before the beginning, meaning eternity past. Okay? And then, of course, you have other passages like Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, that also state that Jesus was God, okay? and he added humanity to himself. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 through 17 speak of Jesus as the creator, just like uh, John chapter 1 does. Um, you know, in my systematic theology class, if you sat through that, you'd remember that I mentioned Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. is very Trinitarian. Let us make man in our image, right? Who's the us? Who's the our? 
Uh, obviously, the, the Trinity, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit created humanity. Well, the second person of the Trinity became a man. So the one who created flesh also took it upon himself, which is uh, just fascinating and amazing. And he did that as part of the search and rescue mission to seek and save that which is lost. Um, we also see at various points in the Old Testament, and this is debatable, you know, some people say these are theophanies, others say Christophanies, but in the Old Testament you see this mysterious being called the angel of the Lord who's clearly God. And I'm of the position that the angel of the Lord was Jesus before he took on flesh, mainly because the New Testament teaches that Jesus is the, the visible image of the invisible God. So it makes sense that even in the Old Testament, when, when you see God appear in a physical form and speak to people, it makes sense that it would be the second person of the Trinity. Um, but again, scholars debate that. I, gave, uh, I give some scripture references down there like Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 and 15, Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 through 25. Um, and a couple reasons why I think that these are Christophanies. Um, I mentioned a, a couple of those a second ago. But also, um, if you think about it, once Jesus takes on flesh, you never see this angel of the Lord again. Um, stops appearing. He appears in the Old Testament up till the end at some points. Um, but then when Jesus, uh, is, um, when Jesus becomes flesh in the womb of Mary, pretty much you, you don't see that anymore. Okay, So with the pre-incarnate Christ now covered, let's move to the incarnation. This, for certain, was the uh, greatest event in history. Every single promise that God makes depended on this. It depended on the incarnation of Christ, Him becoming flesh. So, speaking historically, when did the incarnation happen? When did the second person of the Trinity take on flesh? Now, as I mentioned in the, um, I guess, the prolegoma to the historiography lessons, that uh, our current dating system in B.C., A.D., that wasn't around when Jesus was born, okay? That's something that came in the 6th century, okay? Um, so that was a 6th century innovation, but we still think in terms of, of that calendar. So based on that calendar, when would have Jesus been born? Well, before I say that, let me tell you what they did use as a dating system back then, the AUC system. You might say, what is AUC? It's three Latin words. Um, Oh, gosh, it was uh, ad or it could be ad or annos, depending on who you're talking to. But let's just say ad, uh, uribis, uh, gosh, what is the C word? Either way, it means the founding of the city of Rome, okay? They dated everything off the founding of the city of Rome, and pretty much the time Christ was born was around 750 years after, supposedly, the, the founding of the city of Rome. Uh, but you have to understand, the AUC system was all based on guesswork. Nobody really knows when Rome was founded, okay? Um, but they picked a date, whether they were right or wrong, and then they counted years since then, okay? Now, even though you have to guess about that, there's one thing you don't have to guess about. You don't have to guess about the reign of Herod the Great, okay? You don't have to guess about the death of Herod the Great. It is pretty certain that he died in what we call 4 B.C., okay? And so... We know if he died in 4 B.C., we know that Jesus was born before he died because he tries to kill Jesus, okay? So you know that Jesus had to be born no later than 4 B.C. Could have been a little before, uh, but no later than 4 B.C., okay? And some people give you a window from 6 B.C. to 4 B.C. because Herod tried to kill all children to and below in, uh, in, in Bethlehem, okay? So they say, well, he could have been born in 6 B.C., up to 4 B.C., you tend to have uh, liberals opt for the 6 B.C. and then conservatives for the 4 B.C., and you'll see why in a moment. Let me narrow this down for everybody, okay? Um, at the start of Jesus' ministry in John chapter 2, it's kind of interesting what, what happens there. In John chapter 2, Jesus cleanses the temple, and then people are asking him, what is the authority for him to do this? And he says, strike, you know, strike down this temple in three days, I'll, I'll build it back up. And he's talking about his body. But they thought he was talking about the literal temple. And so they tell him, this temple has been being built for 46 years. It took 46 years to build this temple. And they weren't done yet. But that's an important clue. It means at that moment, they're saying this temple, 
has been under this renovation, this, this new construction for 46 years. If you could find out when that started, you could then count 46 years. We know from Josephus that Herod started this uh, renovation of the temple in the 18th year of his reign. Roman sources show us the 18th year of, well, the, the sources show us that Herod began reigning in what we call 38 BC. So the 18th year of his reign would be what? 20 BC. Count 46 years from 20 BC and what do you get? 26 AD or AD 26. If you remember, the AD is supposed to be uh, first. Okay, so if this scene happened in AD 26, you could push it to AD 27, depending on what time of year it was. Okay, so let's just say though, AD 26, Luke 3.23 tells us Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry. So he's 30 years old, and they say 46 years ago is when this started. Okay, do me a favor, subtract, uh, and so that'd be 26 AD, right? Subtract 30 from 26. What do you get? Negative 4. What would negative 4 be in our calendar system? 4 BC. Okay, that is why I'm absolutely certain he was born in 4 BC, and that's why conservatives opt for that. Um, and then, of course, there's other factors, like uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 1, tells us that John the Baptist began his ministry in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. We know that Tiberius started co-reigning with um, Augustus Caesar in the year 11, okay? Count 11 forward, 15 years, again, 26 AD. All these numbers keep um, converging on this the same um, date. And then also consider Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. That's where we get the, um, the 77s prophecy. And just to sum it up, he more or less says after 69 seven-year periods, that will be the time of the Messiah. And then after that, the Messiah will be cut off. And he gives us the start time. He says from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. There's three possible dates. The best date is the, um, the first decree of Artaxerxes in 457 B.C., if you count forward from 457 B.C., if you count forward um, that 483 years, okay, that 69 seven-week periods, then you end up exactly in the year 26, the very time that John was baptizing and Jesus showed up to be baptized and then shows up to Jerusalem and gets it, it all comes to that same year. And because of that, that's why we know Jesus was likely born in 4 B.C. Now, I do have to point out, though, that it's not an exact science. I mean, these are pretty exact things that I'm saying, but here's the problem. Our calendars are never going to be 100%. No matter how scientific we get, they will not be 100%. Why? Because we don't know how long a year is. It changes. You might say, how's that possible? Well, there it is right there for you. Sometimes a year is 365 days, 5 hours, and 48 minutes um, and 48 seconds. And then other years, it's 365 days, 5 hours, 49 minutes, and 12 seconds. For some reason, it's 24 seconds apart from one year to the next. And we don't know why, okay? It's because our little human uh, instruments of measurement, like seconds and minutes, they're not exact. The, the, the earth doesn't go around the sun according to the arbitrary uh, units of measurement that we come up with. So we're off a little bit. Okay, now because we're off a little bit, that makes it to where sometimes the years and the days get off. Um, so if we can't figure this out, the ancients couldn't as well. So let me tell you what they tried to do. Julius Caesar realized that the lunar calendars just don't make any sense. And, and so he tried to go to a solar calendar. Um, and he did that in the year 46 BC or 708 AUC. And um, and when he did that, he realized, okay, but if we go to a 365-day year, um, it's not enough. So he's the one who came up with the leap year. Every four years, we have to add an, a, a leap year. But here's the problem. If you add a leap year every four years, that actually is too much time that we add to it. And over the course of time, we start getting more days than we need to, okay? And so um, just keep that in mind. In the 6th century, when John I, the Bishop of Rome, asked uh, uh, Dionysius Exegus to come up with our current calendar, the BC AD. One reason he was off is because um, the calendars aren't as precise as we would want them to be, okay? And so when you go off the Julian calendar, which is Julius Caesar's calendar, um, it's 11 minutes and 15 seconds too long with those leap years. And if you do math over the course of time, you end up getting quite a few days ahead. If you don't correct this, it might be July 
and it's fall time. You're like, wait a second. You know, it takes a while to get there, but eventually that would happen, so you have to correct it. In 1582, Pope Gregory XIII reformed the Julian calendar, and it's now called the Gregorian calendar, and that's what we use. And what they did is they deleted 10 days. They said from the time of Julius Caesar to now, because that leap year is a little too long, uh, we have 10 extra days. Delete. Now, if you tried to do that today, that would destroy the world because all the computers, everything is, is like all set on a firm calendar. Fortunately, back then, if you just got everybody to agree to delete 10 days, it didn't wreck banks. It didn't wreck um, anything. So back then, you could get away with that. Not so much today. Now, of course, in England, England's like, no, nah, well, who cares what the Pope says? Mm -hmm. They didn't jump on board. Neither did the American colonies. But during the, the life of our, our framers in 1752, they then said, you know what? This Gregorian calendar made sense. And so they adopted it. But since it was 200 years later, they had to delete 11 days. So if you find some diaries from that time, you might have some pretty messed up discrepancies on what day people were writing in their, in their diaries. Um, but here, here's, here's what they did, right? They deleted the 11 days or the 10 days back in the 1500s. And then here's what they said. We can't have a leap year every four years. So what we will do is when it's a centennial year, um, meaning like 100, 200 or whatever, we will not have a leap year if that year is dividable by 400. I know that sounds pretty complicated, but there's not a lot of centennials that are divided by 400. But if you um, take the ones that are, you knock off just enough time to where our calendar doesn't need to keep being fixed again and again. But even with all that, it's still going to be a couple seconds off. So just wanted to throw that out there um, just to mess with your brain a little bit. That was the only reason I was there. Okay, so anyway, um, so let's get to Jesus' early years. So he's born. What did he do as a little boy? We don't really know that much about his childhood, but there are apocryphal accounts that were written, you know, second, third, fourth century. Uh, one of them is just horrible. I had to read it uh, when I took a church history class in, in college uh, where little Jesus is just like striking people dead for bumping into him, you know, using his powers, you know, for that way. It's just stupid stuff. But, uh, but pretty much, you know, people wanted to know because the Bible doesn't tell us what he did as a kid. I mean, really, the fact that he lived a mundane, regular, unnoteworthy life until the day he got baptized, people just didn't want to accept that. But that's part of the point. He had to live as a man, just like the rest of us, and, and have a normal life until the time came for him to then start doing his mission, okay? And so people didn't like that, so they made up all these stories, but let's just go with what we know, which is from the scriptures. We know that he was born in Bethlehem. We know he got circumcised on the eighth day. Um, we know he has to flee from Herod as a child to Egypt and then comes back. And, and, and his family moves to Nazareth. We know all that. And then the next time we see him, he's a 12-year-old, okay? He's a 12-year-old in the temple. His parents leave him behind. They're kind of freaked out. They go back and find him. And he sort of rebukes them like, didn't you know I was supposed to be in my father's house? And maybe that whole event is there, one, to foreshadow that this is who he is. He's the Messiah. And maybe to remind his parents, because chances are he didn't do a single miracle in that time. I mean, as far as we know, his first miracle was turning water to wine. So, you know, Mary knew that, you know, she became pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is an exceptional child. This is the God man. But, you know, after 12 years of him tripping over his own feet, maybe cutting himself, crying if he gets a boo-boo, all this normal stuff, it might be easy to forget because he was fully man. And so maybe that moment was just like, OK, hold on. we got to remember this guy has come with the mission. Um, and so that would be my guess of why that happened. And then, of course, after that, it tells us in Luke 2.52 that he grew up in stature, um, grew in wisdom, stature, just like the rest of us. Of course, his is going to be better because he's a perfect human. Um, but you, you have to remember that, that Jesus, as God, according to Philippians chapter 2, he, um, he emptied himself. Now, he can't empty himself of divinity. What that means is he chose to operate as a man and not independently use his divine um, abilities, okay? That he was going to do it by the Holy Spirit. He was going to do it as a man. Um, and that's what he did. And so that's why he had to grow in wisdom and stature, just like the rest of us, okay? So that's about what we know of his early years. Now, once he grows up and his earthly ministry begins, this is where we've got a lot more information. 
uh, because this is what the Bible tells us. Okay? It gives us a lot of info in the four Gospels. Um, so conservatives, again, as I mentioned, tend to date the start of his ministry sometime between 26 and 27. And uh, let's say we start early 27, late 26. That would push his ministry for three years, maybe three and a half years um, into the year 30. Now, where do we learn about uh, Jesus's earthly ministry? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. They are first century documents written by eyewitnesses. They bear all the hallmarks of eyewitnesses. Um, I mean, these people lived in Jerusalem. They get the geography right. They get the culture right. Um, there's second century manuscripts, like early second century manuscripts uh, from the Gospel of, uh, of John uh, that would date it easily well into the first century. Um, so the point is, these are very early documents. Historically, they're a gold mine. I don't know if you know this, but like when we're talking about Julius Caesar and other ancient figures, the historical sources we have about them um, were written sometimes hundreds of years after their life. And yet with the Gospels, it's written within 30, 40 years. Um, and, and then some of the stuff found in the epistles, like there's a, a part of 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul is quoting something that dates back to just six months after the crucifixion of Jesus. And it's very easy to, to narrow that stuff down. So historically, the, the Gospels do provide a gold mine. Now, each gospel presents Jesus from a, a slightly different angle because it's history, but it's theology as well. And so Matthew's presenting the gospel to the Jews to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture. And I'll talk a little more about each gospel author, um, you know, in, in a moment. But, uh, but that's what Matthew does. Mark, he's likely uh, presenting the gospel to Romans because there's more Latinisms in his gospel than any of the others. And he moves from event to event quickly because the Romans were all about the facts. Uh, Luke presents his gospel to the Gentiles in general, uh, mainly the Greeks, and he focuses on the compassion of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, and he was very chronological um, in many respects. And then John wrote his gospel to believers, all sorts of, of believers. And so he's going to focus on Jesus being God. And then we also know that Jesus is mentioned in a few secular records as well, Tacitus, Suetonius, Josephus, um, and I've mentioned some of those in, in, in previous weeks. So let me uh, jump through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. So Matthew, as I said, arranges the ministry of Jesus in five discourses and narratives. And so there's five big sections of Matthew. Uh, some scholars think that Matthew was doing this to uh, match the five books of the Torah. Like if Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel, then what better way to do it than to have his life uh, match the five books of the Torah? Um, so there's, there's definitely a possibility of that. Um, now, Matthew's main concern is showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, not just in terms of prophecies, but like he fulfills it itself. And I've been explaining a lot of this as, as I've been preaching Matthew on Sunday mornings. It's obvious that's what he's doing, right? And uh, like Mark and Luke, what Matthew's going to do is he's going to spend most of his focus on Jesus' Galilean ministry. Um, in fact, I start that this Sunday. And like, why Galilee? It's actually part of prophecy. And so, um, so again, Jesus is the fulfillment of, of everything. And then there comes a point, a high point in it all, where... Um, the Galilean ministry ends, and then he starts moving towards Jerusalem, which means he's moving towards his, his passion. And then, of course, uh, Matthew ends with a very clear um, account of the resurrection. Now, Mark, a little different, um, but you could tell that Matthew uses Mark a lot. Mark also focuses more on the Galilean ministry. Um, and as I said, he's more like writing to Romans, like showing Jesus his power and his authority. But what's interesting is you could definitely see the way Mark arranged his book, the first half of it, the first eight chapters um, up to chapter 8, verse 30, is all about the power of Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's doing miracles. People are wowed. They're astonished. And then right after that, it starts focusing on him as the suffering servant, that he's come to die. And now you start seeing people question his authority. You see people start rejecting him, less miracles and all that stuff until finally you get to the cross. And so there's a definite structure, and, and, and scholars all agree that chapter 8, verse 30 and 31 is the hinge where it all changes. Okay, verse 30 is Peter saying, you are the Christ, and then verse 31 is him telling them he's going to die. And then from then on, you start to see that being the focus. And so that's what Mark wants you to see when you're reading it, that he is the Son of God, but he's the servant of the Lord. 
you know, both are, are prophesied in the scriptures and they're the same person. Okay. Now, when it comes to Luke, as I mentioned, uh, he, he's also going to focus on the Galilean ministry, but his purpose is to record a very detailed chronological account. That's why, like, he's telling you it's the 15th year of Tiberius. He's telling you in this year of Augustus, this happened when this guy was the governor. Luke is very specific, and that's why even his, his birth, um, his account of Jesus' conception and birth is so incredibly detailed. And he tells us that he interviewed a lot of eyewitnesses, which would make sense that He's focusing on Mary's perspective in Luke. She was still alive to tell him all that. So I think what we get in the first few chapters of Luke is actually Mary's account, which is, again, fascinating. But Luke uh, presents a clear presentation of the resurrection, just like Matthew, and he sets us up for a sequel um, in, the, in the book of Acts. And then, of course, uh, John. Got a couple, couple slides on John. Um, John is going to present Jesus' ministry in, in quite a few different ways. But one way that's helpful is active and passive um, aspect of his ministry. Okay, And so most of the book is his active ministry. And what I mean, about, what I mean by that is he was going about, he was very active in doing miracles and in teaching. And whenever anybody wanted to kill him, they couldn't touch him. He could just slip right through them. When it was his active phase, he did what he was called to do. Nobody could stop him, okay? But the passive phase begins in John chapter 17, verse 4. During this point, he's now allowing the will of the Father to befall him. And so he only did one miracle in that time, and that was to heal the severed ear that his uh, disciple Peter um, was a little too eager to cut off, right? But Jesus' plan wasn't to do any miracles during that time. I mean, obviously, God decrees everything. Um, but the, the fact is, this is his passive phase, but he's like, all right, I got to make up what Peter just did here. You know, that's, that's where that one, uh, one miracle comes from there. But he didn't fight back. He didn't allow his disciples to fight back. He didn't even open his mouth against accusations. He didn't open his mouth till he was finally put under oath to answer. Are you the son of God? He's like, yes. So the enemy got to do what they wanted to to him. Now, this doesn't mean he was helpless because remember when they first came to arrest, arrest him, and he said, I am, they fell down on their face, okay? So Jesus, um, he laid down his own life, as he said. No one truly was able to take it from him, okay? But he was doing everything at this point in obedience to the Father. Now, the reason why people, some scholars focus on the active and passive aspect of his ministry here is because of verb tense, okay? In John chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus concludes the active phase of his ministry by stating in the active voice in the Greek, he says, I have glorified your name or glorified you by completing. Okay, it's active by completing the work. After that, it's passive. And when you get to John 19, 30, then in the passive voice, okay, where it's not him speaking actively, it's in the passive voice, he says, it is finished. Okay, so everything's active up to 17, 4. And then he says, I've completed what you've sent me to do. Now I'm just going to stand here and let happen to me what is supposed to happen. And then once that's all done, he then passively says it is finished. Okay. And of course, don't forget the, the victory of it all. He rose from the dead. In John, he performs a lot of signs. Um, and then we know from uh, Acts, he, he uh, spends 40 days with the disciples doing signs and wonders, teaching them about the um, kingdom of God. And then after that, from the Mount of Olives, he ascends to the right hand of the Father. Now, a little more from John also. He's going to focus a lot on Jerusalem, whereas the other gospel authors focus on the Galilean ministry. John records every time Jesus goes to Jerusalem and lets us know what was happening with that, which is some pretty important stuff. And those are key points that the other gospels don't cover for us. And so John closes those gaps for us. And one thing I would also mention is just like Matthew's an extremely Jewish gospel, so is John. Some people act like, oh, John is the most Greek of them. No, no, it is just as Jewish as, as Matthew. Um, and John ends with a very just straightforward, strong uh, presentation of the resurrection of, of Christ. Okay, so then the next question people ask historically about the ministry of Jesus is how long was it? How long was he out there ministering? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't really give us anything to help us with that. They, they just don't. Uh, they tell us what he did, but they don't give any time indicators. John, though, in his gospel is very helpful because he mentions three Passovers. 
specifically in chapter 2, 6, and 13. Now, I'm sure most of you know Passover happens how many times a year? Once. And so based on the number of times Passover is mentioned, you can start calculating uh, how long his ministry was. Now, if three Passovers are mentioned, how many years does that give us? Anybody want to shout it out there? It actually only gives us two. You might say, say, what? Well, okay, let me give you an analogy. Let's say you go to the doctor, you're sick, and the doctor says, okay, I need you to take three pills, okay? One each hour, okay? Well, if you take the pill right away, after one hour, you've taken the second pill. And then one more hour, which is two hours, you've taken the third pill. So, ha! Ah. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is another feast in John chapter 5 that is just called the feast. Some manuscripts say a feast, but most say the feast. Of all the feasts of Israel, there is only one that you would call the feast without naming it. And that's Passover, because that is the feast of feasts. And even if the manuscript says a feast, let's say those ones are the right ones. Still, if you're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, you're going to call it the Feast of Tabernacles, because people aren't going to think that's the feast, or just like a feast so important you don't even have to name it. Um, and same with Pentecost. But the one where everybody is focused on it is Passover. And so scholars are, are quick to say that unnamed feast, the feast, and John 5 also has to be a Passover. So if we have four Passovers, how many years are we talking now? Three. And that's why people always say Jesus ministered for three years um, or up to three and a half. You know, it could have been because um, we don't know how long his ministry started before that first Passover. So, yep, good reason to believe there's four Passovers. Good reason to believe there's a three to a three and a half year ministry. OK, so then the next issue when it comes to talking about Jesus is this famed quest for the historical Jesus, which started in the 1800s, as if the Bible doesn't give us the historical Jesus, right? The assumption was the Bible is just a book of myths, and so we got to find out who the man is behind all these myths. And so we could break the, the quest for the historical Jesus into three quests. The first we'll call the old quest, and they didn't call it that in the 1800s, but we call it that because it's old, right? So if you remember, in the 1800s, what was going on intellectually? Anybody remember what that, that period was, what Europeans call that period? Enlightenment. The Enlightenment. Yeah, it should be called the, the era of arrogance, but we'll just go with that. They called it the Enlightenment. They assumed that, that human reason and knowledge and ability was the final authority. Uh, they really trusted human ability more um, than is warranted. And so pretty much they say, we're, we're not believing in divine revelation. We're believing in human reasoning. And based on human reasoning, Jesus couldn't have said this. He couldn't have done that. So they ruled out the miracles, not because they have evidence that the miracles didn't happen, but because they reasoned ahead of time, miracles can't happen. It's impossible. So the multiplying the loaves, the walking on the water, they came up with all sorts of silly explanations for them, like the walking on the water. He was really just walking on the beach, but his disciples, it was an optical illusion. Um, with the multiplying the fish and loaves, they had a bunch of stuff hidden in a cave. Um, where that location happened, there wasn't a cave. Uh, but anyhow, they just made this stuff up. Okay, And so pretty much the goal is, what is Jesus like? And from the Enlightenment perspective, it was very anti-Semitic. So what they would say is, whatever Jesus was like, he couldn't have been like the normal Jew. Because the Jews are backward, they're foolish people, and, and not only that, like Jewish religion's a particular religion, and human reason says that if there is a God, he's concerned with universals, not particulars. He's concerned with everyone, not this one nation. And so Jesus obviously couldn't have been like the normal Jews. He couldn't have thought like a Jew. We, we don't want to understand him in a Jewish concept. So then they start saying what the historical Jesus is like. And the interesting thing is when you read the stuff they wrote about him in the 1800s, coincidentally and ironically, he ends up exactly like them. Jesus ends up being a European 19th century philosopher. His beliefs happen to match their beliefs. You know, it's like, okay, whatever. And so you have a guy, a scholar named Albert Schweitzer, who says, you want to know what the problem with the quest for the historical Jesus is? He happens to look exactly like the scholars who are telling you what he's like. They look in the mirror at themselves and say, that must be Jesus. And so he pretty much devastated the old quest and killed it. 
After Albert Schweitzer, this was like early 1900s, uh, people were like, all right, the quest for the historical Jesus is a fool's quest. It's just people in modern times trying to make Jesus like us. And so the historical quest died until the 1970s and 1980s. And then you get the new quest. Okay, now some of you weren't even alive yet, so you'd be like, who's calling the 1970s and 80s new? Watch it, some of us were alive. But anyhow, um, the new quest, okay, the new quest acknowledged Jesus' Jewish context, right, and the nature, and the Jewish nature of him, but they said it's not significant. They minimized its significance. And, um, and if you want an idea of what the uh, new quest is all about, think of the Jesus Seminar. How many of you have heard of the Jesus Seminar? This is where they, they would get together and they would say, okay, let's vote with beads on the things we think Jesus said and didn't say. So they had colored beads. If you think he said it, use this color. They would go over every verse of the, new te of, of the Gospels. If you think he said it, use this color. If you think he might have said it, use this color. If you don't think there's any way he said it, then use this color. Now, was it based on actual evidence? Was it based on comparing the Gospels to other extant ancient documents they had in their hands? No. It was, again, based on their, ahead of time, a priori um, presuppositions of what Jesus could and could not have said. Very interesting. Well, there's no way Jesus could have said this. He would have never said it. How do you know? Because the majority of us, and we're historians, voted that he didn't say it. Sorry, that's not the way it works. That's very arbitrary, and that's why most people do not believe that the new quest actually gave us anything definitive about Jesus. Again, he ends up becoming, based on this new quest, exactly like liberal scholars in the 70s and 80s wanted him to be. Oh, he was like us. He accepted everything and everybody, and he didn't believe in miracles, and that's all just legend literature and, and all that stuff. Despite the fact that the Gospels are all early, they just said, well, these are people with fantastic imaginations. And so here's, here's the, the part that just really frustrates me about the new quest, okay? They're not bothering to see, like, are the things being said in the New Testament consistent with everything else being written by Jews at that time? And it is. And I'm going to get to that when it comes to the third quest, right? It is consistent. But they would say, well, even if it is consistent, okay, and even if what the New Testament is saying Jesus said totally fits within the Jewish context, we don't believe he would have said that. It's like, okay, so just because you don't believe he would have said that, that means he didn't say that. You get what I'm saying? It's very stupid. I mean, it would almost be like, almost be like historians looking back at Abraham Lincoln, you know, and saying, well, you know what, I think he was a bad guy. So I don't think he would have said the slaves need to be set free. Now, nah, there's no way he would have said it. Now, you got diaries, you got all this other stuff saying that's what he did, but you have some people a couple hundred years later, no, no. This country's irredeemably racist, so there's no way Abraham Lincoln would have said that. You know, it's imposing a modern opinion on the past. I would, to use the critical theorist terminology, I think it's modernist imperialism. Going back to the ancients, telling them, no, you can't really believe that. We're going to tell you what you believed, even though you believe the exact opposite of what we're saying. It's really dumb, okay? So, the next quest, you know, the new quest was just... Clearly, clearly foolish. And so there's going to be what's called the third historical quest. Um, probably late 90s, early 2000s, and it's continuing up to the present. And the third quest said, you know what, let's be like real historians about this. And let's compare what the Gospels say to what we know of Judaism at the time. We got a lot of stuff of that time. Here, let me, uh, let me show you some of this. Dead Sea Scrolls, a boatload of extant documents found in the caves of Qumran. Josephus writes a very, very uh, somewhat complete history of Israel, gives us a lot of good information at that time. Um, and if you can see these, uh, these puppies here, it's called the Pseudepigrapha. Dozens upon dozens of theological works written by Jews in the intertestamental period, some of which were even written in the first century, a lot of them popular in the time of the first century. We have a lot of literature from the time written by Jews by which we can make these comparisons and see if the Gospels are completely divorced from this and what they're saying about Jesus, or if this matches. And the crazy thing is, 
the Gospels present to Jesus and the things Jesus says are consistent with what we know about Judaism at that time, right? And so, so my, my point with this, okay, is rather than the hypothetical form of criticism that the Old Quest used or the arbitrary culturally located criteria of the New Quest, the Third Quest actually compares the Gospels to the stuff from the time. And so I've put in the words of the Mandalorians, this is the way. I mean, it just is. This is the way to do history. And when you, when you look at like what Second Temple monotheism was all about, and by the way, that is one way to, it's like the one ring to, to unite them all. And what I mean by that is Judaism at the time was not monolithic. Like I mentioned last time, you had Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes. Um, there, there was no monolithic uh, Judaism, but there were three beliefs that united them all. Okay, all Jews would agree with what is mentioned under this bullet, Second Temple monotheism. First, God is the creator, Elohim. He is the creator. Okay, there's demons, and, and that's what the pagans call gods, but they didn't create anything. God is the creator. And God's name is Yahweh. And Yahweh is the covenant God of Israel. So one, God created everything. It's the first thing all Jews believe. Second, Yahweh is in specific covenant with Israel. And then third, monolatry. Anybody know what monolatry means? Anybody think I made the word up? No, just kidding. Well, what do you think it means, Rachel? Uh, no, but good guess. I'll give you credit for trying. It means worship of one, worship of God alone. Okay, so the thing is, the thing is, when it comes to uh, to the pagans, they worship a lot of gods, right? Um, you know, the Jews would say, hey, there might even be demons behind those gods. We're not saying they're not real, but they're not God. They didn't create everything. They're not Yahweh, and you can't worship them. You can only worship God, okay? Now, I want you to remember these, these three things because the way the New Testament presents Jesus uh, just happens to fit very well into this, Okay. Uh, but the point is the New Testament presentation of Jesus is consistent historically with the doctrines and beliefs of Second Temple Judaism. They're going to they're gonna run with this. And one thing that I, I want to also point out is in that time, okay, you got God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the Shema. But that word one, Echad, um, allows room for, even though God's one, one of what? You know, meaning there, there, there could be plurality to God. And in the writings of that time, wisdom and the word, okay, so the word of God and the wisdom of God would actually be written. And, and so they're assumed in God's identity. So you have God, you have his word, and you have his wisdom. And all three are mentioned as if they're God, as if they're personal. Now, did the Jews at that time go as far as to say, therefore God is a trinity? No. But what I'm saying is the doctrine of the trinity, the raw material is already there. Okay, it's already there. And so, um, so that's, that deals with the quest to the historical Jesus. Put him in his Jewish context. He makes sense. He's exactly what the New Testament tells us he is. Okay? Now, we do have to understand him theologically. Okay? And this is going to, um, you know, the, 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 um, what I just mentioned about the third historical quest bleeds into this. Because I think you're not going to understand Jesus biblically without those uh, first century Jewish insights. Okay? And so first, when it comes down to, um, to Jesus theologically, you have to understand a plurality within the one identity of God, as I said, was acceptable with the wisdom and the word. And the Shema allows for this. I'll read the Shema on a, on a different slide. But if you look at the, the last Hebrew word, the one that's all the way to the left up there, as I said, it's Echad. This is a very peculiar word in Hebrew. Like, like in, the, in the book of Genesis, it says there was morning and evening, two things. Morning and evening, echad day, one day. Or God gathered the many waters to echad place, one place. Or God made or the husband and wife become echad flesh. You get what I'm saying? You have this oneness, but this particular word often conveys a plurality, more than one thing that is this one thing. Okay, so it's a one and many. It's built into to Hebrew. Elohim is plural. I don't know if you guys know that, as if God's, but then the verbs are always singular, okay? You know, multiple, I don't know how well you understand language, but if you have plural beings, it's going to be a plural verb, okay? Like, they threw the ball. Well, in English, threw, if I said Albert threw the ball, 
or they threw the ball, it's the same. English is weird. But in a, in a lot of languages, you know, the verb becomes plural if the nouns are plural. Well, in Hebrew, that normally happens as well. But with God, the word is plural, Elohim, but the actions are always singular, which conveys the idea that there's this plurality to this one God. And so I'm telling you, it's built into the Hebrew. It's built into the Old Testament. Um, and so you got that. And then also when you look at the Old Testament, just if we're, we're putting a lot of stuff together, God is generally, he's the father, okay? Israel's his firstborn son. So if Israel's his firstborn son, you know, according to Exodus and Hosea and stuff like that, well, then God in general would be seen as father. We know that uh, although the Messiah is described as a man, there's a few passages where the Messiah is described as God. Isaiah 7, 14, he's Emmanuel, God with us. Or uh, chapter 9, verses 7 and 6, he'll be called Mighty God, you know, Eternal Father. And then Micah 5, 2, he'll be born in Bethlehem, but his origin is from eternity, meaning he has no beginning. He's God. And then, of course, Genesis 1, 2 also describes the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who is God. And Joel talks about the Father pouring out or God pouring out his Ruach HaKodesh, the, the Holy Spirit, upon, uh, you know, the young and old. And so you in the Old Testament, you have God, plurality, singular verbs. You got the Messiah being mentioned as God. Father mentioned as God and Holy Spirit mentioned as God. Now, does the Old Testament neatly pull it all together? No. But what I'm saying is the New Testament didn't do anything crazy. Okay. And, and more can be said on this. But the, old, the overall picture that this paints is God is one, but God is many. Now, exactly who the many are within the one God, that's what the New Testament will reveal. But the Old Testament already gives us the hint of God, Messiah, and Holy Spirit. And I even put a, a little note down there. Um, under that, uh, that Shema picture, it says that in the Second Temple era, some writers included the Word of God, which was called the Memra, and the wisdom of God within the identity of God, as I mentioned, and I give sources. So you have, um, you, you have the, the, the first source mentioned there is a Neophyte, um, Targum Neophyte. Uh, it's commentary on Genesis, and then the next one is Pseudo-Jonathan. Both of those date to around the first century. Okay, so it's kind of kind of interesting. And if you're looking for like when people say that John 1, 1 in the beginning was the Lagos, right? And they're saying, oh, that's Stoicism. No, Lagos is just the Greek translation of Memra. And when you go read these Targums, the Memra, it was through the Memra, the word that God created everything. I mean, there's tons of verses on that. I had to research them all for a paper I wrote um, for my last degree. And so it's what John was saying was thoroughly Jewish. He's just saying that Memra became flesh. Um, that's the innovation, that the Messiah is the word that became flesh. But is it an innovation? I mean, if you read the Old Testament closely, there's three passages that, that really should make us expect it, okay? So again, it, continuing more on Jesus, he is presented in the New Testament as this Messiah that's also divine. We know he's a man. First Timothy 2.5 says there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, okay? Yet, as a man, he's presented as God. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, he's worshipped by the Magi. In John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas says, Lord of me, God of me, and worships him. Okay, um, He forgives sins, which only God could do. That's Matthew 9, 2. Um, he's also said to be the creator. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Colossians 1, 15 and 16. So Jesus is the creator. And he's also identified as Yahweh, which I'll show on the next slide. Now, remember what I said about the three non-negotiables of Second Temple Judaism. God is creator, God is Yahweh, and God alone is to be worshipped. And yet the New Testament goes out of its way to present Jesus as creator, Jesus as Yahweh, which I'll again show on the next slide, and Jesus as being worshipped. Pretty much the New Testament takes these common Second Temple Judaism categories of God and says, this is Jesus. And so when people try to say that Jesus was just a man, that, that the Greeks, because the Greeks had this, this habit of turning regular men, heroes, into gods. So they say like a uh, hundred years later, you know, the, the Greeks, it was the influence of, of Gentiles that took the human Messiah and turned him into a divine being. That's just foolishness. That's called the Hellenization thesis. It has been discredited. 
The theory is, as I said, Jesus was just a preacher. He left a strong mark. And so when these pagans far away from Israel who didn't know better, they, they did what was called apotheosis. They turned him into a god. But what I'm telling you is the actual New Testament documents themselves, which were written in the first century, are already from the beginning presenting the Messiah in the most clear divine terms according to Second Temple Judaism. And so from the very get-go, the assumption was Jesus is God. So uh, they call it a high Christology. A high Christology is one that says Jesus is God. A low Christology sees Jesus only as a man. And the liberals try to say it started out low but became high when Greek philosophy was added to it. And what I'm telling you is the history actually proves it started out high from the beginning with a very Jewish flavor to it. And then only later a Greek flavor was added to it. Okay, like the, the Nicene Creed and all those things were great. They, they full divinity of Jesus and, and the Chalcedonian creeds. They did it with Greek vocabulary. But even before they ever did that, the New Testament does it with Jewish vocabulary. Does that make sense? That's what I'm trying to, to get across with that. Um, now, I, I did mention that the New Testament presents Jesus as Yahweh. So saying it's one thing, proving it's another. So here you go. In, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, Moses asks God, he says, you know, he says, if they ask me what your name is, what shall I say? And God gives this very enigmatic phrase in Hebrew. And so what he says is, Eche asher ye, which means I am that I am. Okay. And so right here, when you look at this, when, now most of you know that, that the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, and it's called the Septuagint. So that's the Hebrew of Exodus 3.14. Right here in red, I have Exodus 3.14 in the Greek Septuagint. And what they translated Eche, Asher, Eche as, as Ego, Ami, okay? Now the name Yahweh is derived from this I am who I am, okay? So pretty much in the Greek, it's Ego, Ami. Now here's where I'm going with this, okay? In John 8.58, they asked Jesus, the Jews, like, you're not even 50 years old. You know Abraham? How's that? How, how could you know Abraham? He said, before Abraham was, I am. The words I am are ego on me, okay? Before Abraham was, he then more or less quotes what God said to Moses when Moses says, what do I tell the people you're, who you are? And he, I am. And then Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And just in case you might be missing it, if you read the next verse, the Jews all pick up stones and try to kill him right on the spot. They knew exactly what he was saying, okay? And then, of course, there, there, there's, there's more we could add to this, right? Um, you know, the name, the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, we don't really know if that's how you pronounce it because the Jews stopped pronouncing it around this time. You know, and the reason they stopped pronouncing it is they didn't want to be guilty of taking his name in vain. So what they would do is even though Yahweh, it's yod Hey vav Hey, four letters, in the Hebrew, even though it was, they kept it in the text, they dare not erase it. When they got to it, they wouldn't pronounce it. They would just say the word Adonai. It's a completely different word, which means Lord. So they started calling Yahweh Lord. It became the substitute word for, um, for God. Well, when the Septuagint was made, there was no reason for them to keep Yahweh. They just translated it directly to Lord, which is kurios in the Greek. Well, over and over and over again, the New Testament calls Jesus kurios. Think of uh, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is kurios, you will be saved. And, and what's fascinating is in that same chapter, I had to write a big paper on this one as well. It's like a 40-page paper almost. Um, but in, in this chapter, it builds up from this to Paul then saying, everyone who calls on the name of kurios, the Lord, will be saved which is a quote from Joel, where in the Hebrew it says everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. And so pretty much Paul is taking that quote about Yahweh and he's telling us calling on the name of Jesus, confessing him as Lord is identical to calling on the name of Yahweh. Why? Because Jesus is Yahweh. It's all, all very, very clear stuff, okay? And then just one more. This one is uh, almost all scholars, New Testament scholars, especially Pauline scholars, uh, agree on this reference in 1 Corinthians 6, 8, he is expanding the Shema. He's, he's not, expanding it might not be the, the right word. He's interpreting the Shema Christologically. And so in the Hebrew, it says Shema Yisrael Yahweh or Adonai 
Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our God, Yahweh is one. Okay. Now, the thing I want you to notice is Yahweh would be Adonai. That's how they would say it. So Lord. So you have the Lord and you have Elohim, Lord and God. Lord and God are one. Okay. Now, what Paul does in this passage, if you look at it, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, for, there, for us, there is one God, the Father, all things are from him, and we exist for him, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him, and we exist through him. Both are the creator. It's from the Father through the Son. But he's identifying the Father as God, the Elohim there, and he's identifying the Son as the Lord, the Adonai, the Yahweh there. Uh, it's clear as day. He's telling us, you want to know what, because remember, Echad usually brings more than, it, it, it uses uh, a plurality is one, is in unity. Well, what two things in this case are the Echad or the one? The Lord and the God. One God, okay, one. And what Paul is telling us is that's Jesus and the Father. And of course, we know we could add the Holy Spirit to that as well, because, you know, Matthew 28, 18, you know, baptize them in the name, one name, of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay? So pretty uh, pretty cool stuff there, in my opinion. So New Testament goes out of its way to demonstrate that Jesus is creator, that he's Yahweh, and that he is worshiped. So he's God, that's who he is. And they're presenting it, as I said, in a very, very clear Jewish way. Now, did Jews at the time fully expect a divine Messiah? No, um, but... Did they understand that the Word of God is part of God? And they didn't understand that? Yes. And so what the New Testament shows us is it was always God's intent that the Word would be made flesh. And the way it shows us that, again, is consistent with the Judaism at the time. So what I'll finish with before the conclusion is just a basic chronology then of Jesus's ministry. We know who he is. We know when he was born. We know how long his ministry is. We know that the old quest, the new historical quest are garbage, but the third historical quest, pretty good stuff, right? And so with all that, and then we know theologically um, how the gospel writers are portraying Jesus historically, but also theologically in the terms that make sense for that time. Uh, and so then, uh, so then we just close with the basic chronology then. We know that he ministered in Galilee. Now, he probably ministered for maybe up to six months in the south before he went up to Galilee. But most of his ministry is going to be in Galilee where he's got these uh, teaching signs, uh, where he's teaching and there's these signs and wonders. Um, and then he starts moving towards Jerusalem. He has the triumphant entry into Jerusalem on the foal of the donkey. He cleanses the temple. I think that's the second time he does this. Shows he's a theological and political threat. Um, then for a almost, well, what is it, about four or five days, the religious leaders are constantly trying to trap him in his words. He continually confounds them. Um, he defeats all of them from all the various parties in multiple debates. Then he institutes the Lord's Supper on the night of Passover, um, inaugurates the new covenant. He's arrested. He's crucified, well, tried, crucified, buried, and then raises on the third day. Okay, that's the basic chronology that we end up seeing. And then, of course, after he's resurrected, he spends 40 days with his disciples teaching them. Um, and then he ascends to, to heaven uh, to the right hand of the Father about 10 days before Pentecost. You know, so they had to, they had to wait 10 days without him before the Holy Spirit was uh, sent upon them. So, in conclusion, I got through it. It's a lot of slides. I didn't know if I was going to make it. But anyhow, got through it. Um, you know, a lot more could be said about his life and ministry, but just summing it up, born in 4 B.C., began his ministry sometime 26, 27. Um, our main sources are the Gospels. All were written in the first century. Uh, they give a consistent story, all four of them, but they focus on different emphases. So we use them all to create a, a more whole picture. Um, you know, we talked about the historical quest. The first two were misguided. Um, the third, not so bad. The oldest documents we have on Jesus are the ones in the New Testament, and they present Jesus as the God-man, as the creator, as Yahweh, and as the one to be worshipped. Um, in three years, Jesus, the man, the God-man, changed the world more than all the other men of history. I mean, combined. He rose from the dead, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he will return 
for his church. And so that concludes the lesson on Jesus. Next time, we'll get to the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost, and we'll take it all the way up through the end of the era of the apostles. And so if we could uh, uh, cut the, the recording, then I'll take questions for a little while.